It's been 7 years since Valve released the Steam controller. Absolutely amazing piece of tech that I prefer to describe as Linux of game controllers. A truly unique device that paved the way for the Steam Deck. It features two clickable trackpads, familiar set of face and shoulder buttons, dual stage triggers with both analog pull and a digital switch, and two additional grip buttons on the back. I'm calling it a Linux of game controllers because of its almost infinite amount of configuration options baked into software. You see, Valve didn't just make a controller, they also released the Steam Input Configurator, an app built into Steam Client that translates your input into a low-level hardware signal which is being interpreted by the game as a genuine physical input from a real input device. So basically it allows you to remap any physical input to any other type of physical input. Like here when I press the grip button, the game makes a quick save like if I was pressing F5 key on my keyboard. And here, built-in gyroscope translates movements of my hand into a mouse input. So, thanks to the Steam Input Configurator and two giant trackpads, it became possible to play all kinds of games with a gamepad on a couch. And we are talking about games that were designed with a keyboard in mind. Oh, and don't worry about the risk of running out of buttons. Because Steam Input API allows us to create virtual menus. You can literally make your own touch menu that will appear in the game as an overlay with some pre-configured set of hotkeys. That was a game changer. Valve was super competitive with the Steam controller. It wasn't just about the price, though the price was good. $50 for the controller and the wireless USB dongle that came in the same package. They also made sure that Steam controller supports Windows 7, macOS and Linux. And back then it wasn't a common thing. Just for a second, let's go back to the 2015. It is the end of summer, you are a regular PC gamer with a Windows 7 and you have just bought the new Xbox One controller, which is made by Microsoft, the same company that develops your operating system. What could possibly go wrong? Well, couple of things. First of all, you have to buy a wireless adapter separately for the price of $25. Second of all, drivers for this wireless adapter were released exclusively for the newest version of Windows. And if you want to enjoy the freedom and convenience of the wireless controller, you have to install Windows 10, which was released like a few weeks ago. Microsoft tried their best to force people into switching to Windows 10, whereas Valve made their product available for all platforms, including previous versions of Windows. And that is crazy, because the Steam controller had all the features of the Xbox Elite controller, I mean in terms of layout customization, but was available on all platforms, including Windows 7, and had a price lower than a regular Xbox One controller and didn't require you to buy a wireless USB dongle separately. That was an absolute win, and later, in December 2015, Microsoft had to reverse an earlier decision and to release drivers that were previously Windows 10 exclusive. Oh, and this is not that important at all, but the Steam controller's USB dongle was like three times more compact than the one that Microsoft were trying to sell you for $25. Speaking of the Steam controller, I pre-ordered mine in 2015 and 7 years later it still works. No peeling rubber on a thumbstick, no issues with grip buttons, no failed firmware updates, I never had to recalibrate gyro or to replace some broken parts. I am aware that there are plenty of dead Steam controllers by now, but mine works just like a charm. Though definitely look less premium in comparison with modern Xbox Series controller or PlayStation DualSense. Both of them have better haptics, nice and clicky bumpers, texture triggers and other stuff. But still, I really, really like the distinctive look of the Steam controller. To be honest, it's not a huge surprise that the Steam controller was discontinued after a few years. It never was like a controller for everyone, neither did it succeed at providing plug and play experience. Almost every game required you to spend some time tweaking controller layout and getting used to it. And when you get a closer look at some of the best features, like gyroscope, you realize how difficult it was to set it up properly. 
don't get me wrong, it is a nice feature, it's precise, it allows you to elevate your accuracy, but in order to achieve the best result, it has to be set to a mouse emulation mode. While huge chunk of games doesn't support simultaneous inputs from a controller and a mouse. And I do remember that there were products like Fallout 4 that required you to restart the game in order to change the control scheme. So, in order to properly emulate Gyro, you have to remap every key to the keyboard equivalent. And that ruins the analog nature of the thumbsticks and triggers, while also making in game glyphs and button prompts unhelpful. Full. Take a look from a perspective of someone who are not an enthusiast and therefore have no intention to spend their time tweaking controller layout. Like imagine an average gamer, what can they gain by using a gyro mode? Or let's put it this way, is it necessary to use a gyro mode? Well, actually, no. You see, modern games are designed with a regular controller in mind. All types of encounters, different challenges that might test your speed or accuracy, all the other stuff is designed to be playable with a regular controller. Two thumbsticks, no gyroscope. Game developers learned how to make aim assist less noticeable. Eventually, they began to make hitboxes bigger, they invented stuff like bullet magnetism, they also started to make combat areas less vertically diverse, cover based shooting mechanics became like mainstream, and in the end, it feels like it doesn't worth the hassle to waste your time on remapping every key when you can't beat the game with a regular controller. While being great and versatile on paper, Steam Controller didn't provide any value for an average gamer, who have no interest in spending their time tweaking all kinds of sliders. I also believe that lack of the second thumbstick was nothing but an Achilles heel, because there are still plenty of games that have a control scheme based on subtle movements of each thumbstick, you know, especially when you need to have a precise control over an aircraft or a skateboard. Analog thumbsticks and triggers allow you to make a really subtle adjustments, and by replacing a physical thumbstick with a trackpad, Valve made it way less intuitive and way more challenging for an average gamer to get used to the control scheme, especially if they have to figure out what type of input they should emulate. Trust me, for the first time it can be really time consuming. And, judging by the look of the Steam Deck, that has both two trackpads and two thumbsticks, it seems that Valve has learned their lessons. The Steam Controller didn't fail because it was ahead of its time. It failed because without a second thumbstick, gamers were too perplexed to understand how to set it up properly. And if you take a look at first prototypes of the Steam Deck, all featuring dual thumbsticks, you might come to the conclusion that it was designed to take a sweet spot between versatility of the Steam Controller and a familiarity of a traditional gamepad. That is why I truly I truly believe that the Steam Deck has a potential to satisfy all types of PC gamers, including those of us who want to play an old game that was released without a proper controller support, and those who came from a realm of gaming consoles and just want to have a decent gaming experience right out of the box. With the launch of the Steam Deck, Valve also brought us the new UI, that is soon going to replace Steam Big Picture mode. The thing is, the Steam Controller was a part of another product called Steam Machines, a new kind of living room entertainment system powered by Linux. And so, Steam Big Picture mode was initially designed as a 10-foot UI to suit the needs of Steam Machines, featuring large fonts, huge button prompts, controller-friendly navigation menu, and etc. Oh, and by the way, the internal rendering resolution of the old big picture mode is limited to 1080p, which nowadays seems disappointing, whereas Steam Deck UI is a different beast. It was designed specifically for the 7-inch display. While the Steam Deck is a handheld PC, it still can be plugged into a monitor or a huge TV, and therefore Valve had to keep the balance between the amount of content and its readability. Well, with a Steam Deck UI, they managed to fix a lot of minor problems and inconveniences conveniences of the old big picture mode. I didn't mention this in my Steam Deck review, but the Steam Input Configurator looks way better now. If you spend decent amount of time on tweaking controller layouts in old big picture mode, you'll definitely enjoy how they changed everything. I really like what they were able to achieve with the Steam Deck UI. It feels intuitive and easy to navigate, and yet they managed to preserve a blossoming complexity, so to speak, with a lot of different pockets and submenus to dive into. 
the more time I spend gaming on my Steam Deck, the more I appreciate how versatile and comfortable it is. And I really hope that one day Valve will announce new Steam Controller, Steam Controller 2.0, with two thumbsticks, two trackpads, new haptics engine, and at least four grip buttons on the back. That would be amazing. This was Reluctant Anarchist, and I have nothing left to say.